Greetings, this is Greg. In 1962, Oldsmobile released a car called the Jetfire. It was a relatively small car for the time, slightly smaller than a 2018 Honda Accord, and about 500 pounds lighter. The reason it's significant is because it featured a small V8 engine with aluminum block and cylinder heads, and a turbocharger and methanol water injection from the factory. 1962 and 1963 were interesting years for cars. The muscle car era wasn't quite upon us. That would really start in 1964. Yet there were various powerful cars on the market, and some had pretty unique features. The Jetfire is one. The Jetfire was based on the Oldsmobile Cutlass, which was itself a variant of the Olds F85. These are all three essentially the same cars, just configured a little bit differently in terms of options. These were often called compact cars, but were officially classified as senior compacts, meaning they were small but a little larger than a true compact like the Chevrolet Corvair shown here. The Jetfire ran on the General Motors Y-body platform. This platform was shared by the Buick Special and the Pontiac Tempest. The Tempest was unique in that it had an independent rear suspension and a rear-mounted transaxle. All three were available with a 215 cubic inch V8. What made the Olds Jetfire unique was that its V8 was turbocharged and methanol water injection. The first turbocharged production car was the previously mentioned Corvair, but the Jetfire came out only a few weeks later, so it's the second production turbocharged car, and not by much. Of course, the Jetfire still has a number of firsts. It's the first production car with the turbo V8, and the first with methanol water injection. Let's talk about the engine and how it's set up. It's a 215 cubic inch unit, which is about 3.5 liters. The same basic engine was used by Buick and Pontiac, along with some variations. Eventually, the British adopted this engine for use in Rovers and in some Triumphs. In the Cutlass, meaning the version without the turbocharger, this engine, when equipped with a manual transmission, put out 185 horsepower and 230 foot-pounds of torque. When equipped with an automatic, interestingly, they raised the engine's compression from the normal 10.25 to 1 to 10.75, and power jumped from 195 horsepower and torque to 235. For the Jetfire, they added a turbo to the 10.25 to 1 compression engine. With 5 pounds of boost, power went up to 215 horsepower and 300 foot-pounds of torque. That power gave the four-speed jet fire a zero to 60 time of about eight and a half seconds on skinny little bias ply tires, and a quarter mile time of 17.1. For a compact or near compact car in 1962, those times were very, very quick. The turbocharger was a small unit from the Garrett Air Research Corporation, a company that had a lot of experience in this field from their work during the Second World War. During the war, Garrett produced intercoolers for the B-17 Flying Fortresses and other bombers, as well as pressurization systems for the B-29 Super Fortresses. The turbo was set up to deliver a peak boost of 5 PSI. It could do it by about 2200 RPM. Not bad. Of course, with the high compression V8 and a relatively light 2800 pound vehicle, even before the turbo was boosting, the car accelerated reasonably well. The methanol water injection system was very interesting. Various U.S. fighter planes used similar systems in the Second World War, but the jet fire system is a bit different from the typical U.S. system. It's actually configured in nearly the same way as the German MW-50 system used in their airplanes. I have a description of that system and of methanol water injection in general in another video. I have a link to that in the description. Instead of using a pump to spray water into the intake tract, it uses boost pressure. When the turbo is providing boost, that pressure is used to pressurize the fluid reservoir. That forces fluid through the line and eventually into the intake air just upstream of the turbocharger. Now, with modern turbochargers, injecting any fluids prior to the compressor is a big no-no, but this turbo is built to handle it. It also spins at a lower speed than almost any modern turbocharger, at least as used on an automobile. Once on boost, as the engine's RPM would rise, the need for fluid would increase. This was handled in a very simple way that I've not seen done before. It's quite clever. The spray nozzle was located in an area that's like a venturi, so that as the charge air speeds up towards the turbo compressor, pressure in the intake tube at the nozzle location drops. 
Since the reservoir stays pressurized at the same value, typically 5 psi, the pressure differential between the reservoir and the intake tube increases. Thus, the amount of fluid being sprayed increases. I don't think this was very precise, but it clearly worked well enough, and in any case, a simple on-off system would have worked. Many cars today use those systems, uh, especially in the aftermarket. But the system in the Oles was at least one step better. The fluid being sprayed was called turbo rocket fluid. I like that name, but I don't want to say it 20 more times, so let's just call it TRF. It was a mixture of 50% methanol, it's 50%, about 49.5% water, with the remainder being a corrosion inhibitor. If you're a fan of this channel, that mixture should sound familiar to you, as it's exactly the same as what the Germans were using during World War II on the Messerschmitt BF 109 K4. The TRF was sprayed at a CFR of 0.1 to 1, meaning that for every 10 pounds of gasoline through the carburetor, it sprayed about 1 pound of TRF. I don't think it would have been too exact throughout the RPM range with the control system we discussed a moment ago, but again, it only had to be good enough. This rate of spray would be adequate to give an effective increase in the fuel's octane rating of about two full points, meaning it would make 93 octane gasoline effectively 95 octane. That's pretty good. The system had some extra complexity, which actually wasn't all that complex. But for the early 1960s, it must have seemed nearly space age to a typical mechanic. The extra sophistication was there to provide two major functions. The first was to protect the engine when the reservoir was out of TRF. In this situation, the mechanism restricted turbo boost to only one PSI. The second function was to depressurize the reservoir when the engine was shut off so the owner could safely remove the cap to fill it. The automatic transmission used in the Jetfire was GM's three-speed Roto Hydromatic. It was mediocre, and in this type of car, the four-speed manual was the way to go for performance. GM's later automatics were excellent, but the Roto just wasn't, and it cost the car about one full second in zero to sixty runs and didn't do anything particularly well. Automatic transmission aside, so far all this sounds great. A small V8 with a turbo in a light car with a decent chassis and a four-speed manual? Then they added in a water methanol injection system. It would seem that Oles was very close to creating a serious sports sedan and even get a bit of a jump on the emerging muscle car market. However, it was not to be. In advertising, the car was marketed as a sporty car, but Oles did not upgrade the suspension at all over the standard Cutlass, which was sprung way too softly to be taken seriously by any enthusiast shopping for a sporting sedan. While the car's acceleration was certainly good for cars in its class, its price was too high to justify based on drag strip performance alone. The Jetfire's base price was just under $3,000. A customer that was really concerned about acceleration could buy a 300 horsepower Chevy Impala for about the same money. The Impala had comparable acceleration and was a bigger, nicer car. For a little more money, somebody could buy a 380 horse or 409 horsepower Impala which would easily outrun the Jetfire, and the difference in price was just two, three hundred dollars. So the car really didn't have a spot where it fit into the performance market. Thus, the people who bought it were not really enthusiasts. They did, of course, understand that they spent extra money to have a modern, powerful car. But soon, these people started coming back to the dealers and complaining that the cars had lost a lot of power. In most cases, the cars were simply out of TRF, thus limited to one pound of boost. In other cases, mechanics that didn't understand the new systems had messed things up. Remember, this was back in the day when every time you stopped for gasoline, someone usually checked under the hood for you. In the days of carburetors, points, and condensers, tune-ups were needed more often, and a mechanic that didn't understand these cars could do vastly more harm than good. The TRF fluid was only available from the Oldsmobile dealer. In the pre-information age of the early 60s, figuring out what the fluid was and where to get, and if you did figure that out, figuring out where to get methanol and what to use as an anti-corrosion additive was just too difficult for most people. Since the TRF reservoir could be depleted in one to two tanks of gasoline, it was very inconvenient to have to add a fluid which was only sold by the dealers. Inevitably, this meant that people started putting water into the system rather than TRF. At the low CFR of 0.1 to 1, water just won't provide enough anti-knock protection in this application, 
and sometimes this resulted in engine damage. Sadly, very sadly, rather than fixing these issues, Oles pulled the plug on the whole idea. Not only did they discontinue the turbocharger, they convinced the jet fire owners to bring their cars back in, offered to remove the turbo system and replace it with a four barrel carb and dual exhaust. Now I can't prove this next part, but I suspect that the owners were told that the TFR would be discontinued, and of course it was discontinued, and with no source of the fluid, anyone who was actually using their car would have been hard pressed to keep the turbo. Thus, almost all jet fires had their turbos removed by the dealers. Today, an intact jet fire with its turbo is ultra rare. In real life, I've never seen one. Even on YouTube, I couldn't find a single video of a jet fire driving, really driving, with its turbocharger, except for original advertisements from the era, or the occasional video of a jet fire with its turbocharger sitting in the garage idling, or in some cases, putting very slowly up and down a driveway. No burnout videos, no acceleration through the gears, no showing of the boost gauge in action which it had. Uh, really almost nothing. I think that today the number of operational turbocharged jet fires numbers in the dozens at best, which from an enthusiast standpoint is unfortunate. By 1964 the jet fire was dead, but the muscle car era had just begun and that was very exciting. The Pontiac GTO was taking the country by storm. Oldsmobile knew they had to do something. They had learned lessons from the jet fire experience. They took the Cutlass with its new for 1964 A-body chassis, which was outstanding. This time, they improved the handling with upgraded springs and anti-sway bars front and rear. They added their 330 cubic inch V8 souped up with conventional tricks, no turbo, but they got the V8 up to 310 horsepower. This car featured a four barrel carburetor, a four speed transmission, and dual exhaust, thus was called the 442. The 442 was Oldsmobile's muscle car throughout the 60s. That's where we'll leave off for now. This is the first video in this series on 60s cars. Please like, subscribe, and in the comments section below, let me know what you want to see covered in this series. Thank you, and have a good day.